Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Glorious, grand, and gracious God, I come to you right now. I just want to say thank you for another preaching opportunity, and thank you for uh, the call that you have placed over my life to preach your word. Lord, I just ask that you would just hide me behind the cross of there. People see all of you and none of me, and I pray that you would stand by me and give me strength, that your message may be preached fully through me. Lord, I love you, and I thank you for all things that you have done and all things you're going to do. And that's all these things in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Um, for the sake and brevity of time, uh, we will be coming from Psalm 100. Uh, it is a cliche, but I do believe that there is a relevant word um, from it. I will only be lifting up the first verse, uh, but we'll be covering the entire uh, chapter. Um, and it reads thusly, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. I want to talk, teach, and preach to you guys on the sermon subject, a joyful noise. A joyful noise. The mighty God we serve is indubitably worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and of all the praise. The mighty God we serve is a God who deserves adoration and acknowledgement every chance that we get. Don't you know he gave us these two things called hands so that we can praise him with a clap, an instrument, or just a raise to heaven. He gave us these two things called feet so that we can praise him with a stomp or a spirit-filled dance. In addition, God gave us lungs to take in air that would create a strong sound. And he gave us a voice box to vibrate as the air passes through to make that sound. But in order for that sound to have some substance, God gave us these two things called lips that together make up one thing called a mouth. And when we, when we open up our mouth, we can do what the psalmist suggests and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. However, I'm convinced that this is where we come upon the problem. And the problem, my brothers and my sisters, is that not enough of us as believers can be found making a joyful noise unto the God. We can be found sitting silent in the pews in the pulpit with our legs crossed, heads down, hands folded, mouths closed, and sometimes sleeping with our eyes shut, but not making a joyful noise. We can be found making the noise of confusion, the noise of jealousy, the noise of hate, the noise of complaints, the noise of arguments, the noise of sorrow, the noise of anger, but not making a noise of joy for the God that we serve. Also, sometimes we can be copycat Christians, playing the good old game of Simon Says and copy the joyful noise of others. When they shout, we shout. When they sing, we sing. When they say hallelujah, we say hallelujah too. But we fail to make our own genuine and authentic joyful noise for the Lord. Also, we can be found making the noise of attention for them and not him. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want everyone to believe that me and God got a good thing going. Are you on track with me? And sometimes we keep our joyful noise on the hush-hush, under our breath or down to a whisper, simply because we are actually shy and don't want to be seen or nervous and afraid of being heard. But I believe the Lord will be so pleased to see more passion in the praises of his people. I believe the Lord will be so happy to see a revival take place in the, our, our worship to his name. And I realize that for some of us, it can be hard to do. I recognize that for some of us, it can be a tough task to take on. But can I help somebody in the place? You may not be able to sing like Tasha Cobbs. You may not be able to preach like T.D. Jakes. You may not be able to scream and squall or speak in tongues. But you have a voice, brothers and sisters, that uniquely excites the ears of God. So whatever voice you have, whether it is squeaky, small, or stout, you are not mind letting the Lord hear your voice. The devil may have tried to hush you up, but but God wants to see who is going to holler back. Satan may have tried to shut your mouth on yesterday, but the Bible says that this is the day that the Lord has made, and we ought to be rejoicing and be glad in it. So every mouth ought to be filled with a joyful noise on today, because as David declares in the text, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. And I, I want to pump the brakes and park it right here because we need to understand that this is not excluding, but it is including and inviting everybody to make a joyful noise unto God. Meaning everybody whose heart is beating, everybody who has blood running warm in their veins, every man or woman, every boy or girl, despite your denomination or education, despite your color, creed, or condition, let everything, the Bible doesn't say let some things, but it says let everything that has breath pray. Praise ye the Lord. Are you on track with me? And, and so the relevant question is very simple. What is it about God that should inspire us to, 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 as individuals to make a joyful noise unto him? And the first thing that should inspire us to make a joyful noise unto God is his being. 
We ought to be praising God with a joyful sound simply because of his being, or in other words, because of who he is. The text says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has created us and not we ourselves. And the amazing part is that wrapped up in his being is his goodness, which is revealed later on in verse 5 when it states that the Lord is good. As a matter of fact, I believe that he is better than good. He is our creator, he is the maker and the shaper, the molder and the sculptor of our essence and existence. That in itself should be enough to make someone happy in here on today. But however, life's traumas and tragedies can at times get our thoughts all tied up. And I say this because on bitter occasions, we find ourselves being misled to believe that God is not a good God. Our understanding of who he is gets miscalculated and misconstrued all because the current circumstances and conditions are not working in our favor. When parents get divorced, some of us think that God is a home wrecker and not a homemaker. When we lose our job, we see God as a crusher of currency than a supplier of all of our needs. When our friends and loved ones die and depart from this earth, some of us see God as a killer and not a life giver. And when this happens, beloved, we then find ourselves in a predicament of crying and complaining at God for who he is not, rather than praising him for who he is. So if I could borrow the words of the great Dr. Tony Evans, I would tell you, don't magnify your problems, but magnify your God. We need to stop worrying about how bad our problem is and start worshiping God for how good he is. We have to get our minds on what kind of troubles we have and start praising and making a joyful noise for what kind of God we have. Because we serve a God who is as good as he is great and is as great as he is good. Your problems may change, but God's goodness is absolute. Your problems may go higher, but God is still the highest. Your problems may get tougher, but God is still the toughest. So be careful not to get it twisted. You can still make a joyful noise unto him because even in the midst of the storm, God is still the author and the finisher of our faith. Even in the valley, he is still the creator of life as we know it. And even when caught in a tight and jacked up situation, God is still mighty. God is still holy. God is still righteous. God is still faithful. God is still God. And that is not changing in this lifetime or the next. And, and furthermore, it is not only God's being, but it is also God's blessings that should inspire us to make a joyful noise unto him. And I, I don't know about you, but God never ceases to amaze me with his blessings. He has constantly and continually blessed me beyond belief. I, I tell you, it's gone to the point where I wake up every morning just wondering what will my God do next. And, and if I'm in the right place, I can say with confidence that I'm not the only one who can testify of the Lord's blessings over their life. And if we look here in the text, we can read that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That lets me know that we are God's possession, that, that we are God's children, that we are his and that he is ours. And we all ought to be glad on the day that we are his sheep and that he is our shepherd. Because, you see, there's an advantage to being a sheep of God. Uh, a renowned, renowned Christian speaker, writer, and apologist, Alex McFarlane, voiced that the limitations of the sheep are overcome by the power of the shepherd. I'm going to say one more time, the limitations of the sheep are overcome by the power of the shepherd. That means that as his sheep, God blesses us with food to eat when we are hungry. As his sheep, God blesses us with something to drink when we're thirsty. As his sheep, God blesses us with protection when predators come to kill, steal, and destroy. As his sheep, God blesses us with something to with loving correction when we are acting silly and guidance for when we go astray. I, I tell you, it's so inspiring, God's blessings toward you and I. Yet we can find within the church and community Christians who take the blessing God bestows upon them for granted. And it's because we have fallen foolishly to the false and futile impression that God is supposed to bless us. And that because he's our shepherd, it is God's job to bless us, that God is obligated to bless us, and that God is required to bless us. When in reality, God doesn't have to do a doggone thing. God does not have to do what he does or give us what he gives. The truth of the matter is, my brothers and my sisters, is that God chooses to bless us. He decides to bless us the way that he does. There's nothing forcing God to bless us, but he does it simply at the kindness of his heart. We don't deserve the blessing that he has, but he gave it to us 
anyhow. We don't deserve the title that we have, but he gave it to us anyhow. We don't deserve the church that we have or the family that he, we have, but he gave it to us anyhow. And the reason why God grants us blessing after blessing, despite failure after failure, is because as the text says, his mercy is everlasting, meaning that God's mercy will never die. God's mercy will never fade or pass away. And because of that, God will always that means today, tomorrow, and forevermore, God will look past all of our faults and bless us with what we need. So I'm going to lift up my voice and make a joyful noise unto the Lord, not only for his being and not, not only for his blessings, but because he is so merciful, I can make a joyful noise for the blood that he shed for you and me. God saw that we couldn't make it on our own. God saw that we are on a road of doom and defeat. But God being rich in mercy, God being rich in favor, God being rich in compassion, God being rich in gentleness, God being rich in his mercy as the bible says because of his great love with which he loved us even when we we're dead in our trespasses we were dead in our transgressions we were supposed to take on hell and the grave we were the ones who were supposed to be on that cross we were the ones who were supposed to endure all that pain the power and the penalty of sin but god said i have another way god said i have somebody else who could take your place and his name was jesus he sacrificed his only begotten son so that we could all live and not die. He sacrifices the only begotten son so we don't have to take what we deserve. Is there anybody here who is thankful that God decided to sacrifice himself? He decided to give up his only begotten son just for us. I'm so glad that God did that for us. I'm so glad that God is a merciful God. I praise God for the blood that he shed for you and me. He went on the cross and died. But early Sunday morning, God rose up. He rose Jesus up and he died. And he rose and he lived and now the blood can be poured all over us now the blood can be for us because it was the blood that set us free it was the blood that saved our souls it was the blood that rescued us it was the blood that gave us life and i'm so glad that there's still power in the blood there's still power in the blood if you need a healing there's power in the blood if you need forgiveness there's power in the blood if you need to be healed there's power in the blood if you need to be washed and made whole there's power in the blood. If you need to be delivered, there's power in the blood. So if you can't thank God for anything else, if you can't praise God for anything else, you want to praise him for the blood of Jesus. To God be the glory.